All right, it's 4.30 and we'll open the PN planning and zoning meeting for October the 7th. Uh, we don't, don't need to do roll because of the video. Uh, we're going to uh, postpone items 1A and 1B for approval, the uh, minutes for technical difficulties. Still working through our new, new software to get that. That's okay, we'll so. get there. Uh, before we go to 2A, I appreciate we have a couple of members here from the press here from the news to report. Appreciate you guys being here. I hope that in the spirit of transparency, everything that you guys report is exactly the way it happened. So we're going to go to 2A and let Drew take us into 2A. Thank you. This is a preliminary and final plat for towns, Town Creek at Holdsworth, subdivision containing 23.99 acres of land, more or less, out of the Walter Fosgate Survey Number 120, Abstract Number 138, the City of Kerrville, Kerr County, generally located at the intersection of Holdsworth and Cowler Boulevard. Let me go back to Ariel. This is the extension of Cowler Boulevard um, that extends beyond um, Home Run Drive and the lots surrounding that creating four new lots and dedicating that street extension. Uh, that street was built with the original construction, uh, so the properties are <coughs> adequately served, so it's preliminary and final plot before you today. There's the concept plan from the Plan Development District zoning. Uh, this is consistent with that, that layout showing Calo Boulevard continuing kind of to the northwest through the property. The street layouts in this design are intended to be flexible Obviously, we're continuing that existing street, so it's connecting there. We'll continue further through the property. Do have a couple of recommended conditions. Um, reference the Kerrville plat number 2021-065. Um, include the name of the plat. Currently, the current draft just says subdivision plat. Uh, provide the legal description on the face of the plat, not as a separate document. Um, and then there's a general note number three just needs to be completed. That's uh, one of our, their standard notes. But with those conditions, staff recommends approval. Is there someone here that is representing this? No, they're not able to make it. Okay. So, spoke with them this morning and they're familiar with the conditions, comfortable with moving forward. And, uh, staff will be reviewing these conditions once they get those revisions in to make sure they're compliant with uh, the commission's direction. Okay. Didn't we do a, a, a review or a, do a change on that 1201, that address? And, and that's uh, going to be a... Um, in the original PD, there was an amendment to that. Um, this PD got rid of that amendment and the original PD and replaced it. This one yeah, you have up is, now? This is the third, third version of the PD. Um, so it... I think it actually incorporated that initial change, but they did redo the layout. Well, as, as I recall, there was going to be a filling station on that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. On the north, well, what I, for this map would be a north, the northeast corner. I think that's right. Um, that was before I was with the city, um, but I believe that's right. They had you mean there was a life before you were? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe you're right. I think they switched the, call it the west track to Switched the location. Switched right. those around Correct. to okay. get the... And it's a filling station away from the creek. Um, as far as I know, that's not part of their plans at this point. But okay. um, this current PD does control over the previous PD. Well, uh, the, the same reason, that, uh, again, I recall also the, that uh, coming away from the creek was right. the driving force for that. So that, that, that it's still, ex still. Yes, the zoning code includes those kind of. Uh, separations from flood zones. Right. Um, any flood zone, creek, river, certain uses that could have a negative impact, such as you know, a gas spill at a filling station, are required to be separated, um, depending upon the, the creek and the location, but there are separation requirements. Anybody else? Any comments? Any questions on this before we move forward? If there are no Further comments or questions, I would look for a motion to approve the preliminary and final plat with conditions as submitted by staff. I'll make that motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your hand. 
So the uh, approval of the preliminary and final plat has passed. Now we're going to move into our public hearing section. And before we open the public hearing, I'll have Drew uh, present the scenario for the sign variance request. Should we have them come in? Yeah, they're, they're out in the lobby. They're watching. They're going to come in now. Um, Good morning, we Melissa. You guys variance, can come in and go to the often. microphone. Uh, the criteria for a sign variance, obviously, is much different than the zone changes we're typically reviewing. Uh, so I'll go through those, those findings for you. Uh, this is a request for a sign variance in accordance with Chapter 92, the sign code, uh, Section 9214, variances of the City of Kerrville Code of Ordinances uh, for Kerrville Hobby Lobby Lot 1, generally located at 2105 Sydney Baker. Again, this is request is to add an additional sign. Uh, the current location or the current sign. Get my mouse going. Is located on this corner of the property. The request is to add a second sign on this corner of the property. Uh, just running through the findings that you have in your backup. Uh, the variance request has been made based on the lack of signage on the existing freestanding sign, or excuse me, the existing monument sign. And the property's south entrance uh, was built as a right in, right out only, uh, as required by TxDOT. TxDOT also added the traffic delineators uh, on the center stripe, prohibiting any left turns in or out of the property. Uh, so this access is the same for all tenants. The literal enforcement of the sign code would not create an unnecessary hardship and is consistent with the general purpose of this chapter. The request is not contrary to the public interest nor a detriment to the public welfare. Uh, the sign code was reviewed in 2019, and as a result of some of the action of the Kerrville 2050 plan, uh, this type of situation was not specifically addressed. Um, hardship has not been proven, and therefore the variance is not necessary. The request is based off the development of the property and the traffic requirements set forth by TxDOT. Uh, the request is not based on the subdivision of the land. The request is not based on any self-imposed circumstances and does not make the property more profitable or valuable. The request could be considered a modification to the regulations within the sign code by allowing the property to have two signs where it would currently only be allowed one sign. Um, it does not constitute a change in zoning, and the sign itself would not be prohibited by the sign code, other than the fact that it would be a second sign. Um, we don't typically give a recommendation for variances, but obviously based on the findings, um, staff were to give a formal recommendation, it would be to deny the request. Uh, we have spoken with the applicant, and I think we've got a, a different path forward. Um, one of the things, I'll go through this to kind of show you their request. So there's the proposed location of the second sign. So one of the things that we've talked about for the uh, sign code itself, I've had a lot of comments when we were reviewing the sign code in 2019 and prior to that, that the sign code was for the freestanding and the monument signs. Really the goal was to promote monument signs over pole signs or freestanding signs uh, due to aesthetics because they are a monument that matching materials of the development and so forth. Um, with this project and reviewing a couple other projects, the actual regulation of monument signs is more restrictive than that of the freestanding sign or a pole sign. Uh, so if the commission's interested, we can certainly bring back um, some possible code amendments to allow multiple monument signs instead of multiple freestanding signs. Uh, this would also has an interesting piece to it when the property was developed, that existing sign was built on the multi-tenant center property. That sign includes Hobby Lobby and Starbucks. Hobby Lobby's property actually does not have a monument or a freestanding sign. So if this sign were on the adjacent parcel, this property would still be permitted to have a free right. or a sign, uh, whether it be monument or freestanding. Uh, so there's a little nuance to the way this property was developed. Um, but we'd be happy to go through uh, with the applicant for this one and just with staff, our building official and some other departments and review an update to that portion of the sign code if the commission would be interested in hearing that. 
So before we go further with this, I'm going to open up the public hearing and let the applicant speak and if anyone else who wishes to speak, and then we'll close the public hearing and kind of go through the scenario we can uh, fix the problem that yeah. was not created by them. So I'm going to open the public hearing up at 440, and we have the sign applicants here. If, Melissa, you want to speak about what you're doing and what we need? Yes, thank you. Um, Tell us who you are. Melissa Southern, 114 Molina Road, Kerrville, yep. Texas. Uh, and we, uh, we own Rails Restaurant, and now we're, we're opening Qdoba. Um, I think uh, Drew explained it properly. Uh, what looks like we have two issues. The first, that there's really no signage available for us or for the tenant that will be coming in. We don't know who that is yet, but so we're not just speaking about us, but also about a future tenant. And the fact that Hobby Lobby is a separate property, but they've, they have signage on our property. So I'm sorry. They have what? They have signage on our property, but they're actually a separate property. Right. Yeah. So um, if Hobby Lobby's sign weren't there, we would technically be allowed to have signage there. So that complicates matters. Um, and then also, after the property was built, as we showed you guys, you can't turn in there anymore. So um, TechStop put up barriers not allowing you to turn in. So um, if you were assuming that that's where you turn in for our business and whatever business is going to be there, you'd actually go ahead and have to head out to the loop. And, you know, after that, how do you get into the businesses? So those are two things that are, you know, complicating matters, and that's why we were requesting the variance. But uh, understandably, Drew is saying that maybe that isn't quite the way to go about it. So we discussed it, and, you know, we're, <laughs> we're happy to do whatever you guys feel is necessary, but that's what we're looking for. Thank you. We appreciate your patience. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak at the public hearing on this? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. 441, layman's terms. When the property was developed, the monument sign was put up. It was all one property. And Starbucks was the only tenant along with Hobby Lobby. So Hobby Lobbies and Starbucks went up on the monument sign. And then Hobby Lobby bought their property. And so Hobby Lobby is on the separate property, but the sign is on the developer's property who maintained that property and is a tenant. So it created a quandary. So I, and I, what we're going to try to do is look at the sign code and see if there's a way to tweak it, which will cover hopefully future situations like this. And as soon as we can, get back to them and help them get their sign up. In essence. Yes, we'll look at the sign code. Like I said, the, the regulations between the monument sign and the freestanding sign to see if we can get that a little better in sync with the intent. Um, look at development lots versus individual platted lots, because uh, there are some allowances for multi-complex, multi-tenant signs, um, such as the existing sign. Um, obviously, the, the way it was built is limited to those two tenants and didn't account for all of them. Uh, that's the developer's opportunity when they had that initial sign built, but we'll look to see if we can kind of refine that uh, to answer some of these situations because we do have a lot more small multi-tenant buildings coming in this this size and obviously it's going to continue to be an issue so the question that melissa brought up is they are the tenant and they have presented a sign that meets code that could be put up but what about the other tenant that's going to go in there what are they going to have to are they going to have to put up another sign or their proposal does include a second panel so you could have, it okay. It says the, the bottom part of that sign would include the other tenants. So Great. We're, yeah, we're accounting for them okay. as well. And there's only, <laughs> there's only one other space, Melissa, in there besides you? Yes. Okay. What's the distance between the monument sign and the proposed sign? Do we know, like? Say that again. What's the distance between the monument um, sign and the proposed sign? It's a pretty good. Pretty substantial distance. Yeah, pretty yes. substantial difference. Say at least 200 feet. I'm not sure. Uh, exactly. sure. <laughs> well, at this point, it becomes two properties because right now the monument, well, no, it doesn't because the monument sign is on um, the developer's property. Right. So it is. It is. Hopefully, we can come up with some resolution. Definitely. That's definitely a problem. So, just... hopefully, we will get back to you guys as quick as we can and look forward to getting over there and getting some of that homemade guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, for your Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Did you want to go ahead and take action on that? Yeah, so we will defer action at this time. Is that what we're going to do? Or? Go ahead and take a vote. Okay, so we'll vote on granting the variance and uh, based on staff's recommendation, more or less, 
the recommendation not to grant the variance at this time. So do I have a motion? Well, not to not to grant the variance and work at this on, time. Yeah, work on subject to no. coming back with a, a sign code amendment. Yes, yeah, so I'm trying to change it and get it to where they can put their sign up. So, okay, very well. Right. I'll make that motion. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second on that? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your hand. So we will not grant the variance, but we will get back to you guys something that hopefully solves the problem. We digress for just one second. second. Yeah, uh, well, you can listen. The, 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 just expand on your observation or what has come clear that a single sign is more flexible or you're more, we're more able to do something with that rather than a monument sign? Um, is that what you indicated? I've had a lot of comments that the sign code was intended to promote more monument signs, but the allowances for a pole sign are pole sign. greater than that of the... So if the other sign, sign was a pole sign, we, this one would be okay? If it were one property, it would actually be allowed to two pole signs. Right. As Not one two. property, it's only allowed one monument, one monument sign, regardless of how right. large it is. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that, that, like, so little so. things that don't quite line up, in my opinion. Yeah, so. we definitely clean that up. But that's being worked on or seen to? Or? Yes. Very well. Okay. You're going to work on it. Yeah, right. A few. All right, we're going to move on to the next item, which is a resolution to allow conditional use permit for short-term rental unit on Lot 3 and part of Lot 4, Hillcrest Subdivision, 1008 Tybee Street. The applicant is out in the lobby. The applicant is out. We'll have her come in, and then we can... This is a resolution to allow a conditional use permit at 1008 Tybee. Thank you, ma'am. Introduce yourself and introduce the case. Hi, I'm Lizzie Riley, and um, my husband and I would like to turn one of our properties into a short-term rental on Tybee Street. And uh, we have a couple of long-term rentals already in Kerrville, and we thought this would be a great location for a short-term rental. Um, we're both involved in the community. Um, we're both teachers, and we have also children that play baseball. And um, you know, we've we've had experiences with. Um, other families and uh, teams from DBAT that when they host tournaments, families and teams are having to stay in Fredericksburg, and um, we kind of thought we'd like those people to come in and be a part of our city here when they come in for tournaments. So we figured that would be a great spot for a short term rental. Cool. Do you have anything you want to talk about before we open the public hearing? Yeah, I'm going to go through the rest of the staff report. This property and the adjacent properties are all zoned single R1, single family residential. Uh, <coughs> since there is no change in the base zoning, it is consistent with the Kerrville 2050 plan. The short term rental does require one parking space per bedroom, say three bedroom house and no on site manager. This will be required four parking spaces. Um, I'll come back to the map. And here's their site plan showing how they're going to acquire those four parking spaces. This, this block has dual frontage on Tyvee and Oak Street, so the driveway is actually in the rear of the property. Um, recommending approval with the standard conditions that we've developed for the short-term rentals. The guest notification, uh, just reiterating the requirement to pay occupancy taxes. Uh, signage requirements should they choose to sign it. Minimum off-street parking, maximum occupancy of 10 guests, and of course any other zoning regulations supersede. Please answer any questions. Well, let's open the public hearing and see if there's anyone here. We're open this public hearing at 449 on 1008 Tyvee Street. Is there anyone? I have no speaker request for. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak? That's the applicant who's already spoke, so we're going to close the public hearing at 450. I took a look at this property. I think it lends itself correctly because of the location and the layout. It has. Uh, substantial room for the parking they're going to create in the back it's not going to create any traffic on Tybee Street it's a main street has a lot of amenities relatively close what else anybody else I like it it's close to the golf course straight shot to the stadium and D-Bat makes yeah. makes good sense close to Water Street a lot, a lot of 
Anybody mm -hmm. else? I did have one question if I'm yes, uh, Driving by today, I noticed a for sale sign on the property. There is a for sale that. sign. <laughs> um, that's a debate between my husband and I. <laughs> He, he wanted to put it up for sale because he was nervous about the short-term rental. It's a risk, and uh, I convinced him, I think we should try, and now that's why I'm here. So It's going to be interesting to see who wins out. Uh, I, <laughs> I hope it's me. Thank you. Any, yes, anything sir. else? Dave? That's all right. Go ahead. No, I'm shy. No, you're not. <laughs> um, yeah, I noticed the for sale sign too. You know, whatever else. And so what you're saying is that it's as things are. It's a family discussion. Yes, sir. And um, our plan right now is to move forward with um, you know completing the back where the drive is and making the parking spots available. Um, and we're planning on this being a short-term rental. If somebody comes along and does happen to offer us a great offer for the property and my husband and I decide that that's what's best for our family then and you know just full transparency you know that would be a conversation for us okay well full transparency if we if we grant this as of uh, this today does that does it go with the property yes it, the short term the conditional use permit goes with the property if the next owner does not use it as a short term rental for more than 12 months then the conditional use permit would expire. Yep. But as long as it's in continual use, the ownership can change. And the same same conditions, parking, yes. uh, noise. Yeah, uh, that doesn't change the requirements. They'll just inherit that that permit. And that's a a floating twelve months. In other words, if if at some point in time, that's just general information. Yes. That if you uh, if you had a short term rental, you decide to move back into it. And that 12 month period expires. That's correct. All right. So, is there an effect on the short term rental permit if someone, uh, somebody else buys it and they rent it to someone for six months or a year or eight months? Is that is that allowable? Yes, it is. It doesn't prohibit the long term rental, okay. but if that long term rental exceeds 12 months, it's the then the conditional use permit expires. Hmm. And that is the only caveat is you don't know who's going to own the property, but I guess we deal with what's today and not what could happen in the future. How do you monitor that? Our finance department monitors that through the occupancy tax and the rental of the property. All right, so you the, you rent it six months lease and you get a six-month six extension. Is that reported? Uh, they wouldn't report the long-term lease. It would just be the lack of short-term use that's reported. Okay. If that makes sense. L lack of occupancy tax being collected. Oh, correct. Okay. Okay, that's the trigger. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah, all right. I was trying to... Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Comments? Not I'll entertain a motion to approve the conditional use permit for 1008 Tybee subject to the parking being provided. We'll make that motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your hand. So the motion passes. So we hope that you win and your husband doesn't. I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's my goal. Come on. Well, I think we got a little insight into the thing with the household. Come on. Thank you. No, that's just the standard operating procedure in the Sigerman household. Hey. <laughs> Amen. All right. We're going to move on to... That's our next thing here. A resolution to allow a conditional use permit for a short term rental unit on lot two and part of lot. No, that's what we just did. Okay. No, this is no, this is this one. 516 Florence. Yes. All right, Drew. Is that 516 Florence? I won't skip my maps this time. Here's the overall map showing the short term rentals in the city. The green are grandfathered uh, prior to the 2019 ordinance. The red are approved conditional use permits, and the blue are two pending cases today. And there's this location here. There's one grandfathered across the street, and two more operating on Water Street a couple blocks away. This is roughly the first block off of Junction Highway. That I'll turn it over to the applicant. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I grew up in Corville. My husband and I bought that house about three years ago and lived there for a year or a year and a half. Did a long-term rental and are now looking to do a short-term rental with the property. So you you were the landlord for a long-term rental? I was, yes, sir. Now you're looking to turn it into short-term rental? Yes, sir. Okay. Very much so. Well, I'm going to open this up for a public hearing at 4.55. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak besides the applicant on this conditional use permit? There's no one. I'm going to close the public hearing at uh, 4.56. And Any letters from the neighbors? We did have two yeah, we letters. Yeah, two letters in favor. In favor. Oh, okay. um, kind of seeing the aerial. This has a long driveway to the garage in the back. Uh, this is a two-bedroom house with no off, no on-site manager, so it requires three parking spaces. Um, you can see in that photograph, there's two cars parked there, and there's still room for adequate room for one. So a single, so you could you could park three. I drove, took a look at it. Sure. You could, you have a garage. Yes, sir. And then you theoretically looks like to me you could park three vehicles in the driveway Easily. from front to back. And the garage as long as it remains as a garage does count towards right. the parking too. So they actually pretty substantial backyard where to gate. I saw that as well. And it, the garage will say garage. Okay. Yep. So the letters that came in favor of, they were from, one was from across the street. Yes, sir. And where was the other one from? Across the street and the house immediately behind. Okay. It's the, um, the big white house that's being renovated. We go by there and take a look at yes, that sir. as well. Yes. Been a lot of renovation in that area. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions or comments? Well, I'm with nobody. I, I kind of expected you to have some neighbors that would be upset about this, but. So uh, we talked to several of the neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, I think to, you know, again, full disclosure, uh, our long-term tenant was not the best tenant. And I think this, everybody feels like this is going to be less disruption to the neighborhood uh, uh, than getting a tenant like that again. By chance, did you speak to the neighbors on either side of you on the same I side of the street? I talked to the Fitches, who are, if you're looking at the house, they're to the left, they're on the corner, okay. and they were in favor of. Okay. Centrally located. I mean, it doesn't, it's not like a straight shot to amenities like some of these other properties have been, but with one across the street and a couple of her on Water Street. I will say we've had a lot of inquiries about it currently. Um, we're well connected with the wine community um, and the camp community, and so we've had people looking for more rentals. So that's kind of what spurred this as well. I mean, it's, this is a tough one for me. My inclination is this is really in a very, very middle of a residential neighborhood. It's not on the main street, but it doesn't seem to be an issue for the neighbors. <laughs> Well, that's, I, I, I was expected to come in here because I know that, that street, but, um, I mean, it's a quick, what, a block and a half from the, from Main Street. Right, so it's very close. It's very easy to, easy, get, easy to get in and out. It's a so, super easy walk or bike ride to the river trail. There's yes. a nice little park for families. Right around the corner. I saw yeah, that. Mm -hmm. And there's, I, I believe in the old TSO now, there's a restaurant going in there. There is. And so. Yes, we, we approved the. On that building as well, yeah. Anybody else? That. Any comments, boys, girls? Just for clarity, uh, off the of the map, the one the house right straight across the street. Yes, sir. Is is already a. That's correct. Yes, sir. That's one of the letters, right? Yes. Is that that is the letter? <laughs> right. Yeah, it just dawned on me. I don't know its impacts, but I would think that that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting that they've had a short-term rental in the neighborhood for a pretty good while. Have you ever had any complaints or anything over there from anybody? Uh, we actually were able to complete um, comparison with police call records huh? um, for 2021 since January um, with the short-term rental list that we have from finance. Outstanding. Um, I think there were 11 hits on the different addresses. Almost all of those were traffic calls, not actually related to the short term rental. Oh, really? Um, that's good. That's encouraging. So you guys live here in Kerrville? Yes, sir. You're mm -hmm. going to be kind of like hands-on managers? Oh, absolutely. And so 
I don't know this. I might be shooting myself in the foot, but the house across the street is my parents' house. The one that's um, a short term. You got the letter. Right. They wrote a letter, right? <laughs> and so, uh, Did they put the birthday card in the clear, front or in the back? Um, but they, uh, they've had that place for as long as I can remember, and they've rented it out um, short term rental for the, at least the last eight years and have had no problems with the short term rental. No complaints of the neighbors or anything? No, sir. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. I, I take that back. There was one complaint about the outside lights, and so they just took that light down. <laughs> she's, very, she's very well connected with the neighbors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, it, you know, the, the neighborhood is special to us. My, my parents have that house. We're very good friends with the Fitches next door. Um, the house behind us, who also wrote a letter, is a family friend. My brother and sister-in-law and my niece and nephew live in the neighborhood, so, you know. That's we, why we didn't get any letters, Trish. Right, yeah. <laughs> so we, we really are trying to, we want to do something that's going to be better for the community, less disruptive to the, to the neighbors, the, oh, the people that's, that live there. good information. Time. Okay. Anything? No, no. Just... David, any questions? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Since we have heard all we're going to hear, I'll entertain a motion to approve this Request for a conditional use permit. Motion to approve. Motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Okay. The motion passes. Thank you all very much. You're very good luck. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to 3B. An ordinance to annex the city of Kerrville. You want to you want to go through this, Drew? I can read that. Yeah. An ordinance to annex into the city of Kerrville incorporated limits with a zoning classification of R1 single family residential district. The following parcels, approximately 15.925 acres of land, within a certain 328.55 acre of land situated in the Florentine Laura Survey Number 123, Abstract 225, Kerr County, Texas. Approximately 0.651 acres out of lot 61 of the heights of Kerrville subdivision, Kerr County, Texas, and approximately 0.274 acres of right of way for Coronado Drive. And it changed the zoning on approximately 1.499 acres of a portion of lot 61, the heights of Kerrville subdivision, from RE to R1, consisting of property generally located at 700 and 701 Coronado. Uh, just kind of go over some quick procedural pieces um, with this being a petition annex annexation request the council of course asked the planning and zoning commission to give their opinion on the annexation and a formal recommendation of the zoning uh, so whichever whatever decision is made by the planning commission this case will go to city council for the annexation request um, but obviously council is going to look to the commission for that recommendation um, I just want to make sure that that was well understood. We talked about that at the end of the discussion last month. Um, just want to make sure we, everyone was clear where that goes next. It does go to council for that next step. Uh, would you ready to go through the staff report? or Let's go through the staff report, and then we'll open up the public hearing. <clears throat> Where's the property to the north is Kerrville Heights, zoned RE. Uh, the property to the southeast is zoned R1, the Village Glen subdivision. Just a couple of photographs on Coronado. And here's the um, Glenview and Mount Laurel um, existing street subs the dead end into the property. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, the gray area is to be annexed. That includes the mouse. That includes the undeveloped property here. This portion of Lot 61 of Kerrville Heights and that this portion of Coronado Street. This portion is to be rezoned. Oh, excuse me. This portion is to be rezoned from RE to R1. This portion is already inside the city limits and zoned R1. And here's the initial layout that they've proposed. <clears throat> Coronado Drive, of course, is the ex existing connection uh, as well as Mount Laurel and 
Glenview Drive, or not Mount Laurel, Laurel Wood Drive. Um, any development under that R1 standards would be required to meet, you know, off street parking, setbacks, uh, lot sizes, and, and so on. Um, yeah, the request is a minor change to the Kerrville 2050 future land use plan since this area was incorporated as part of the Heights subdivision uh, as a residential, no, rural estate place type. Um, since they are going to R1, we're recommending the neighborhood residential to match the Village Glen neighborhood um, place type on the future land use plan. Uh, but given the development, the existing street stubs that are already from the existing neighborhood and the two existing curb cuts on Coronado Drive, uh, you can see that the intent was that would develop as smaller lots with existing streets to connect. The staff recommends the case for approval. Can you please answer any you questions? you put the map back up with the plan yes. development? This is Laurelwood. This is Glenview. And of course, here's Coronado going up to the private gate of, of the Heights. So the, the, the cul-de-sac lots are larger lots, it looks like. Yes. Yeah, both this cul-de-sac here and, of course, this hint too. Mm -hmm. I know the applicant does have a presentation, and I know we do have one presentation uh, for Ms. Peterson as well. Do we need to open the public hearing to have the presentations? That'd be fine. Let's go ahead and open the public hearing at 5.06, and I would like to hear from Mr. Welburn before we... Mike. No, 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 no. I'd like to hear from Mike. Okay. Mike. Uh, this, this is the honor. Um, okay. <laughs> what I want to hear is I want to hear... Okay, we can have him speak. I want to hear your, your... You were going to come back to us with your concept of how you're going to improve the drainage. and sure. that's So if you want to have the owner speak first, that's okay. fine with me. Um, I think it's just one the introduction and then um, and then we have a presentation we can go through. Well, I want to hear your presentation. Okay. Right, let's go ahead. Can you pull, go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint? And Connor Odom with our office is going to present. All right. Over here. Connor Odom with Wellborn Engineering and Surveying. We are the project engineer as well as the surveyor for this development. And we are assisting the owner with the annexation. I'll process. mic up a little bit so we can hear you. <clears throat> we are located at 631 Water Street, Kerrville. So during the previous PNZ meeting on September 2nd, the PNZ Council proposed the decision for annexation to allow the developer's engineer the opportunity to meet with the neighboring property owners and present to them and explain the drainage plan for this development. On September 24th, the Wellborn Engineering and Surveying Team held a meeting at our office with the neighboring property owners to present the drainage plan as well as explain it. There was eight, eight neighbors in attendance during this meeting, we presented and explained the drainage plan and tried to help answer any questions that they had regarding drainage, as well as lot design. Today, we would like to present and explain the drainage design for those that were unable to attend and for those that still have drainage concerns. After the presentation, we'll be happy to answer any questions or scroll back through any slides that you may want to take a closer look at. Okay, so looking at the existing drainage area map, we have two main watersheds, <coughs> existing watersheds. The Blue Hatch area is existing watershed A. It's a 24.26 acre watershed that drains to the south and flows through the Village Glen subdivision. Does this also have a laser on it? No, it doesn't. Oh. So it flows down through the Village Glen subdivision and enters an existing 30-foot drainage easement between the Mount Laurel lots and the Foothills Drive lots. 
as you can see with the pointer. There we go. Let me go back one for us. So that blue hatch area, all that water, sheet flows on through Village Glen subdivision and enters. Yeah, this does not work well. We're trying to use the pointer to show you the path of water. I'll move, and then after entering the existing 30 foot drainage easement, the water flows to the east, goes underneath Laurel, Laurel Wood Drive, then underneath Coronado Drive, and enters an existing detention pond on that southeast corner. So that's the drainage from the whole blue area, 24.26 acres. Yes, sir. That's that what we're saying. Estimated sheet flow, <clears throat> the 100 year storm event amount of runoff and as you can see water shed existing watershed B that green hatch area flows to the east and runs onto Coronado Drive and then goes south along Coronado Drive and enters that same existing detention pond and it's estimated that that runoff is 41.38 cubic feet per second for that green hatch area running onto Coronado Drive so both areas eventually lead to that existing detention pond on the east side of Coronado Drive. Now looking at the plan for the post development, post development, we're now splitting some drainage areas. The blue hatch area is what's left of the existing watershed A. The green area is what's left from the existing drainage area B that is still flowing onto Coronado Drive. And that red hatch area is 18.12 acres, which is we are proposing to be captured by the street through curb inlets on the sides of the curb and enter to a central storm drain or storm pipe that runs through the middle of the proposed road. Once it enters the road, the drainage from the 18.12 acres it flows through that storm pipe to the east, crosses underneath Coronado Drive, and still underneath the ground, it will pass through a proposed 20-foot drainage easement in between proposed lots 41 and 42, where it will let out into an existing 50-foot drainage easement, already existing along the backs of proposed lots 41 through 44. Once it reaches that existing drainage easement, it flows down to the south, where it lets out into the existing detention pond on the east of Coronado Drive. So as you can see, the, the existing drainage watershed, the area is greatly reduced since we're capturing 18.12 acres of that 24 acres we were looking at previously. And just to take a closer look, so that blue line that we have running through the middle of the proposed main road, that's the storm sewer pipe that would carry the runoff that comes onto the street east and under Coronado Drive. Now the blue hatch area is still running through Village Glen, but it's greatly reduced. We'll show a couple of examples in later slides. And the green hatch area is still running onto Coronado Drive, eventually leading to that existing detention pond. So just for sample purposes, we chose, sorry. Okay. Just for sample purposes, we showed two lots and gave their existing watersheds compared to their post watershed areas with this development. So the two lots that we chose was 1728 Mount Laurel. As you can see, the existing watershed, the blue hatch area to the left of your screen. This area is, I believe that says 2.46 acres. And it produces 10.14 cubic feet per second at the 100 year storm event. That's how much water is flowing into their backyard at 1728 Mountain Laurel. Then we chose a lot that had a smaller existing watershed. 
And so we chose 1704 Mount Laurel. The existing watershed is 1.15 acres. And the amount of water flowing to the back of their lot on 1704 is 4.81 cubic feet per second. And now we're gonna look at, with this proposed development, what is now getting to those two lots. And so as you can see, now we have the two blue hatch areas that the areas have greatly been reduced because north of those proposed lots, we have that road capturing the, that 18.12 acres. To take a closer look and provide you with some calculations, on the left side of your screen is the drainage area, the proposed drainage area that would drain into 1728 Mount Laurel. The new drainage value, the runoff rate for the 100 year storm event would be 2.57 cubic feet per second. This is a 75% reduction from the existing watershed that's coming onto them. Now, if we look at 1704, which had a smaller existing watershed and had less existing water com coming onto it. The new 100 year storm event runoff rate is 2.50 cubic feet per second, which is still a 48% reduction in the amount of water coming onto them from pre-development compared to post-development. So this concludes our presentation. If y'all have any questions or any slides. Can you go back to previous map? Yes, sir. So I'm looking at the, at the left side of your map beyond the cul-de-sac. Yes, with all the work, that drainage right there that's coming in with all these lots at the left side of the right in there. Yes, sir. Is that still going to continue to drain the way it would pre-development? And so if this one will better show it. So as you can see, we're capturing some of that area mm -hmm. that was draining south of our proposed development. Now, in order to further increase, we may need to install a drainage easement with an mm -hmm. open channel between those two far left lots, lots 24 and 25. We already discussed with the owner that that may, we may have to do that to further decrease what may come into those Mount Laurel lots on the south side. So you're basically saying you've captured everything up there that's in the red that's going to come down and go along the street. It's it's going to directly go to an underground storm pipe right. that leads to directly to the detention problem. So the existing theoretically detention you've problem. removed everything except for the blue area. Correct in the green area. Well the green was already going through Coronado already going Drive. Coronado, yeah. It doesn't enter the neighborhood. Are you saying that the the, uh, the the black arrow line is is a storm drain? So the black line with the arrows, that's a flow path line. Let's say okay. right. a raindrop dropped at the right. top okay. of the right. sack. That's the what you then define your sheet. Flow. Right, to provide our Q calculations. We estimate right. the time of concentration using that flow path. So, so you're capturing it with the curbing of the street? with curb inlets. They're not shown on this plan, but we'll have a series of curb inlets along both sides of this proposed street that will connect to this central storm pipe, that blue line running down the middle of the proposed road. So there'll be curb inlets to collect that water so it's not just sitting and flowing Which down. Which is, the, the blue line, purple line, is indeed a storm sewer. Yes, sir, a proposed storm sewer. If I might ask a question, you've talked about the cubic feet flow. What kind of rainfall rates are you looking at for the cubic feet? And so it's the 100 year storm event in which that's outlined in the city of Kerrville drainage design manual to use. And we use those intensities specified in the manual. How about, can we talk in numbers of inches of rainfall? Number of inches. Maybe Mike can help answer. Mike Wellborn, 631 Water Street, um, Wellborn Engineering and Surveying. So it varies. It, um, so there's a manual 
and depending upon the intensity, the storm duration, it can fluctuate. Sure. But what that is, the 100-year storm event is a storm event. It's a 1% chance of any given year that that storm event will occur. And so instead of designing for the NOAA event, um, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Association Agency, through the um, flood insurance program says um, for insurance purposes that you have to design for a set uh, storm, storm rain event, which is the 100-year storm event. So that's the maximum storm event to which is readily um, required to be designed by. Well, let me ask you, the detention pond on the other side of Coronado. Yes. It's been there a while, if I remember correctly. It was actually built as part of the Heights. It was, right. it was built prior to that. However, it was improved with the Heights, which included this development to be included as part of that. What kind of capacity is in there? You know, it's designed to originally had like 800 cubic feet per second that was going through that area, and now it's letting out fully developed with this development included 600 and something, under 700. So it's reduced it by about 100 CFS, okay. which is cubic feet per second. The reason I guess I get hung up on inches of rainfall, you know, we have an acre of land and it rains one inch. Mm -hmm. You got over 17,000 gallons of water. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we designed, it's a pretty high criteria for a 10 minute, correct me if I, just if I get off here, about a 10 minute rain event, we're looking at 11 inches per hour. Think about that. That's what this is designed for, Mike? Correct. Okay. Actually, it's a worst case scenario. It's the worst anything, of worst. Anything yeah. above that, the, the CFS is less. Unless we have a NOAA event. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner, if I will uh, interject real quick. This is getting extremely technical at this point. Uh, the, the key thing to remember here is is really these two, and, and I, I think I'm on the right, yeah. The, the thing to look at is this map and, and this next map here, the, the two that we're looking at. What Welburn has done is, is a lot more, uh, and I say Welburn, Mike Welburn and, and his team, this is a lot further than we've you know, really got at this point. We're just looking at annexation. Right. Part of our job as city staff is to ensure that Welburn's team complies with state requirements. So, I mean, we could talk technical, uh, 11 inches an hour, you know, the CFS and all that stuff. I mean, really, that's what we look at. Uh, and actually, we've got a, a tiered structure of development that council adopted that is effective as of uh, last Friday to help with the uh, drainage impacts. Part of, you know, to, to your question on the detention pond, part of that requirement that he has uh, allotted is taking, taking the flows from the existing conditions. Which, okay. So when, when he looks at this project, uh, essentially everything to, to state law, everything on this blue property, um, now i got to find, do you have the mouse? Or, uh, everything on the southern boundary of, of this blue line where we've had a lot of the com uh, uh, contentious comments in the past uh, you know, through this existing development. They cannot be impacted more than they are today. That is state law, that is city requirements, and, and so what they are proposing with this development is for a lot of the street to capture a significant portion of that hillside flow. So they're, they're gonna have a reduced flow. Are they gonna eliminate all of it? No, there's still gonna be, now, I mean, they, they can go through extensive measures as, as you know, uh, I think maybe Connor uh, alluded to, but that's part of our, our review. That's part of our site review. That's, if, if they have water going there now, we're going to try to reduce it. That, that's going to be his design team's uh, goal is to reduce it, but they cannot exceed what's there. And that goes to this entire area. That goes to the uh, entire watershed area that goes into that detention pond. So there's there's also floodplain. I'm trying to see. If, I don't know if you got on here, but I think it's about uh, about right in here. This is floodplain, it, and so we, we have to look at, at every element of this, and I, I don't want to get off, off track and, and you know, get into a lot of the details because this is very early in, this, in the game. We have not even, we've seen, we've seen this because they're being generous and being forthcoming. We do not know the details, and, and they've done a, a study of that. I know you guys asked, but I don't want this getting to an hour-long discussion when we haven't even had a chance to, to look at any drainage report. And we're, we're not at that point yet. Uh, so if, if you will, just kind of you know, just look at these two 
uh, and, and really just kind of look at the, the percentages of flows that, that Connor and, and Mr. Walburn have really lo looked at, that we are going to reduce the flow you know, as, as part of this development. That, that's the key thing to, to remember here, because we can't fix what they, if, if they already have the hillside draining on them, we can't fix that. Uh, that that's just reality, living in the hill country. But what, what they are going to do is reduce it. And, and that's the key thing, because uh, you know, determining 11 inches per hour, uh, and uh, I think he said 48 CFS, you know, that, that's, if, if you're not dealing with it every day, you don't really know what, what level that is. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, and so I, I don't want to, to throw numbers out there that, that seem large uh, when you know, really the ultimate goal that we've got to look at here is existing versus proposed, and, and that reduction to these adjacent properties. That's the key thing. So. So at the end of the day, or at the end of your your analysis and, and uh, Welburn, Welburn's input and whatever else, will there be a, I mean, how does that work? Do you say, okay, we're we're going to say that the, the flow is X, okay? Right. It, and then, and then uh, that it, the flow will be less than this yes, going sir. forward. Yes, sir. After, after your development goes in. Is that... Yes. So he will do, if, uh, and, and I don't know how far uh, his team has gotten into this, if this truly is the, the existing watershed, uh, yeah, they're, they're going to look at a larger picture. I, I think this is probably a little bit uh, less than the watershed, because when he looks at that pond volume, uh, we're probably going to look at the, the heights uh, and, and what goes into that element. And, and what they're really focusing on here is just showing you the adjacent properties and, and the impact. And that, that's well, that's, what, that's, that's what we're most in. Right. And so that's where he will do a, a full comprehensive drainage study and, and make sure that we, uh, you know, we, we get that number. And like I said, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like an, a very large number because you're dealing with a, a large area. But the key thing to look at is what is detained in that street because, that, unfortunately, that is city of Kerbal policies is to, to flow into the streets and, uh, and instead of you know, subsurface. But it's, it's going to go into the streets. And so that, that next proposal that he's doing here, going, you know, just that bottom portion of, you know, of the blue area now is, is all that they're proposing to impact the uh, adjacent properties with. Well, if you look, that, that blue area is a lot smaller, and, and so you got a lot less. That they're going to push that down the street and, and just, you know, follow uh, all the city guidelines, the state guidelines, you know, any, anything and everything. So that's what I just want, because it can get scary when you look at some of these numbers. I mean, there's times where we look at numbers that are five, six hundred you know, CFS. Well, that sounds you know, enormous. Well, okay, existing was actually seven hundred. Uh, so that, that's what I want you to kind of focus on when, when you're looking at this is, is really the reduction. You know the number right now? Do you know the number? No, this is the first I've seen of this. No, I'm talking about do you know what the drainage, uh, what's coming down on that whole property that's running into the neighborhood? Do you have that? No, I, I have not seen any plans for this other than what we've discussed here because uh, again, this is just the, you know, we haven't even received the, or did we receive the preliminary plan? Yeah. yeah. So this is just annexation. Like I said, they're, they're forthcoming with the conceptual plan. At this point, we, we don't even get engaged on this uh, other than, okay, we, we know this is coming. What impacts are we going to have? And that, that's why I'm here. I want to make sure that we kind of focus because we don't have the full level of details. Uh, you know, he, he probably hasn't even looked at the, uh, or at least at this point, he, he may now, how he's going to slope the street or, I mean, just, you know, how we're going to, do the lots. So it's you, just a, theoretically the, 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 the annexation gets approved. Mm -hmm. At that point, the only way you're going to know if they reduce, state law says it has to be less than what it is now. The only way you're going to know that is if you go out there and figure out what the flow is now. Right. And, and that's part of their requirement. They, they're, he is going to submit us this map. And, and like I said, this is going to be more cumulative because right now we're just kind of looking at those impacted areas. Okay. This map will be on one page showing all existing conditions, and then he will have uh, something similar to this uh, on another page. There, there's also going to be another for that detention bond. And, and so that's, you know, I don't know how he may do it in a report, uh, you know, may do it on plans. It's going to be a, a cumulative uh, drainage study that he's going to be required that, that we ask on all of our developments to verify the impacts we asked the, uh, the middle school you know, we've even on our Olympic Drive uh, Lennar development you know, out there the city property that that is all key components to development and like I said the, the biggest thing is that they cannot impact the uh, more than existing conditions.
So that's like I said, I just I, I know like I said, the, the numbers can get scary, and that's I don't want to get that you know out there to to be uh, one way or the other. You know, but like I said, the key to focus on is uh, the reduction. So when you're looking at that, if you mind just think about that as opposed to the the, the flow numbers that that is going on. So I want to be clear that this is, and I'm sorry, I missed the last meeting, so I'm actually playing catch up on this, okay. apparently. Um, all of these items with the drainage study, that's well above and beyond anything that would be required for the annexation, correct? This is something that comes in more when we're considering the plat, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, so we're not, I mean, not to, so just kind of dumb I'm it. glad to see it, it's catching me up, but. Shane, we had some, some neighbors that we were concerned. We have substantial okay. neighborhood So we asked back. Mike to go back and show, demonstrate how this is going to work. Okay, but their issue was probably related to the existing conditions pre exactly. pre development. That's yeah, there's that, that whole hillside drains in okay. the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's like I said. That this is much more much more information. Uh, this is about what we'll see at preliminary plat. This is more what, when we get our, our civil construction plans into this development. This is the level of detail that it will have on uh, on a typical. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but our issue is once we approve this annexation. And this zoning, we're stuck with it. I know that you have to you have to approve what they're going to develop, but there's no going back. And with this much pushback from substantial amount of Kerrville citizens, residents, right. we right. need and we need to go above and beyond what is normal. Yes, and, and that's why I ask not to look at the flow rate, but the percent of flow reduction. Yeah. Numbers are not. I'm not looking at flow rates okay. and numbers and everything. I'm yeah, just looking. Like at, so they can get a little scary if you're. I mean, you get that whole hillside. Uh, so. Okay, so. I just want to add that. Thank you very much. Uh, have speakers. Uh, are you done, Mike? Uh, did you want to make your presentation before we have the speakers, ma'am? That'd be lovely, unless Bruce Strait, you would like to chime in. Say so he doesn't have a dog in the fight. I don't know if Bruce okay. is here. Can you pull up the other what, presentation? All right. Uh, let's, are we talking about annex, still just talking about annexation? Zoning. This is one of the neighbors. This uh, is uh, yeah, I, I, I got it, Mike. I, I, let me just clear this up. Is there a step we can take now? Are we going to do the annexation well, we're separately got, from the... No, what we're going to do is she's got a presentation. We're in the public hearing. We've got speakers. Okay. And once it's all, right. all done and we close the public hearing, we will go to the question of annexation and zoning. Very well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hi, Jenneth Peterson, 1728 Mountain Laurel. Uh, conveniently, my house was one of the ones that got analyzed. That was interesting. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really nervous. Um, so if I'm a little shaky, please forgive me and look past Nobody's gonna bite you. my demeanor and, and hear what I'm saying. Um, so the residents of Village Glen would like to take a moment to thank the PNZ Board um, for offering us an opportunity to discuss our concerns with the developer's proxy agent uh, before making a decision. Um, we had the opportunity to meet as a neighborhood. Um, you can see our goofy little meeting there. Um, and we discussed our hopes and potentially solutions that we could pre present to the civil engineer regarding our concerns about what was gonna happen. Um, the group asked me to continue to lead the team meeting uh, with Mr. Welburn and also to bring our refined concerns back to you, the board. Um, it's really easy to feel like as a citizen that our concerns just won't be listened to because we're just little voices without any financial backing. Um, we're just people who care about what's going on in our neighborhood and there's likely more of us you're going to hear from um, and we really appreciate you taking us seriously. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that as neighbors to this project, we've had some really emotional reactions to this. Um, we're mad about stormwater issues being ignored in the past. It, losing our privacy, we're concerned about the construction process and noise and traffic and trash that that's going to bring. Uh, we're worried about the wildlife that lives back there and what's going to happen to them. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that it's not the city's job to make us feel better. Your job isn't about feelings. Your job is to protect us from harm. Okay, so this isn't going to be about feelings. So the eight of us went to go visit with Mr. Welburn. Uh, that was all right. Um, we shared some pictures and videos with Mr. Welburn and I'll share them with you. Um, these are these are the grades, um, and I wanted y'all to see the existing 
floodplains. Um, you can see, I don't have a, I don't have a laser, so I can't get super cool with this. But you can see this, this, this little Y right here. This is the flood zone that's back behind foothills. And then it joins up with this floodplain here that is behind valley and goes down across Glen down to Elm Creek Park. So folks, that's where all the water's going to go. All the water that's going to get shed from this new development is going to that Y. Okay, and that's not just about Mountain Laurel, that's not just about foothills. That's Valley, that's Glen, that's East. Those are all people who are represented by this concern. Um, we shared pictures of our, um, where am I pointing? <coughs> just, just more floodplain. Um, kind of wanted to show you, ignore the goofy guy, that's my husband, he's there for perspective. <laughs> that's my backyard. We've got seven feet of retaining wall uh, in my backyard that holds back the water. I don't see the kind of flow that he's talking about because my retaining wall is higher than the contour behind me. Somebody did a really good job managing that, but all the water went to my neighbor's yard. His yard didn't get designed nearly as well. Um, so when we went to go meet with Mr. Welburn, there really hadn't been much additional work. It was, there was a lot of discussion on the fly about the raindrop on the hilltop. Um, we uh, asked for certain mitigation efforts to be included in their plans. We asked for reduced construction density. Uh, we asked for a, a drainage easement between the new development and the planned construction, uh, or even to allow the neighborhood to purchase the land from the owner. Um, allow us to form a legal entity to maintain it as a wildlife preserve or a park. Um, we've had no response to these requests. Um, despite our best efforts, it appears the two parties are kind of at an, at an intellectual impasse. Um, the civil engineer, who's, let's be honest, he's not a disinterested third party, has told you that his design is going to make things better for Mount Laurel and Foothills Drive. His argument completely ignores current absorption rates. That is completely permeable land behind us. He's going to shift that to about 50% permeable. Streets, roofs, driveways with cut-ins into that curb. There's going to be cut-ins for driveways. Water's going to go in. Water's going to come back down. So those flow rates that he quoted you don't include things like that. So he gave you some pretty fantastic percentages, but it doesn't include what the finished product is going to look like. It's going to be a lot of impermeable surfaces, surfaces that don't absorb water. Um, I actually used the publicly, oh, this is, this is Valley Drive. Remember I was telling you about where all that water goes? There's that big retaining pond down on Coronado that all this water is going to go into. And then when it drains out of the retention pond, it goes to Valley Drive. This is what the conditions on Valley Drive are like now. Okay, so we're going to add some more water to this. Yeah, the kids are cute. They look like they're having a great time. That's not what our street should look like. But they do. And I don't see how that's, not, that's gonna get better by adding more water. Um, I did the calculations um, using the EPA's floodplain calculator. I'm not gonna bore you with details, but essentially when you go from 100% permeable surface to about 50% permeable surface, you lose half, you get a 50% increase in stormwater runoff. And if you don't include that in your calculations, it's not really, a re you can't really figure a reduction if you're not including that. I know that's pretty advanced design stuff, but those are the things that we're thinking about as the neighborhood. His argument also ignores that the planned cul-de-sac on that highest hill um, will drain the foothills as water follows curbs and gravity, not stormwater plants. I'm going to show you a quick video. It's more Mountain Laurel. I wanted you to see this. This is the storm inlet behind Foothills Drive. And I want you to see what our current conditions look like. Mr. Welburn's plan is going to add water to this situation. This is behind our houses, behind Mountain, between Mountain Laurel and Foothills Drive. This is the floodplain that didn't exist before Mountain Laurel was built and now exists because my house and my neighbor's houses are there. 
this floodplain grew after our houses got built. So this is what my neighbors deal with. Now this isn't a drainage easement. When this was developed, this was made um, private citizens' property. So private citizens are having to maintain this drainage through their backyards. Many of my neighbors now have to pay for flood insurance when they didn't have to before. So I talked about the idea that the plan kind of ignores the impact of even more water flowing through the homes on Valley, East, and Glen. And we understand that as a civil engineer with a long-standing reputation and involvement with various levels of responsibility in the city, Mr. Welburn is of the opinion that the draining, drainage system is working as intended. I don't know, is that what you intended? If this is an example of successful stormwater mitigation, maybe you can understand why the neighborhood is gravely concerned. Um, Heights LLC didn't cause this, uh, but they're not gonna make it better. Um, our requests and suggestions have really been met with silence from the developer. Um, subtle threats from their proxy agents. We heard them in here. It could get sold to a track builder. Um, we, sh we could just move in a bunch of single wides. Uh, there's another plan to put 80 houses in there. It's, it's clear from these statements, both on and off the record, that the developer and their agents aren't really interested in the reduction of harm, but maximizing their profits, and feel entitled by their influence in the community to intimidate us and this board into compliance. The residents of Village Glen, Valley, Glen and East stand by our original petition with six additional signatures since we last met with this body in September. The fact of the matter is that we have no power here. We have no political influence. We have no eight lawyers. We have no HOA to protect us. We are currently suffering from poor engineering and flood management in our neighborhood. And the city granting their R1 request is gonna make our lives worse. I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the civil work, the dirt work it's gonna to take to make that property buildable is prohibitive, very expensive. We have to acknowledge that this property, along with the Heights, both owned by the Heights LLC, has a history of failed development. Not the Heights, but that land. There's a reason why that land has failed to develop. Previous owners dabbled with those ideas and abandoned them, as evidenced by the road cuts and the utility connections to the existing neighborhood. Annexation with RE zoning reduces the risk to the adjoining neighborhood when, and I'm not saying it will happen, but if the land is sold, sold to a different developer, you brought that up. It could be sold to a track builder and then we're stuck with R1 zoning with an entity outside the city who could give a darn less about us. So we could end up with R1 zoning when it becomes clear this project will fail to produce the intended profit results that the developer is hoping for. And then we're stuck. We would ask the city to grant the proposed annexation but humbly submit that the most reasonable course of action would be to zone the property RE to reduce the proposed roofs, driveways, and other impermeable surfaces. Maintain more foliage on the property, reduce future harm to the adjoining and downstream properties. We additionally believe that the RE designation, reduced density construction, exposes the city of Kerrville to less risk of stormwater mitigation crisis in the future. I'm ready for your questions. Anybody have any questions? That's probably my husband out there clapping like a maniac. <laughs> David? <laughs> not, not at this time. I mean, just. Thank you. I appreciate you helping me with that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I do have two more speakers uh, Arthur Cross. My name is Arthur Cross. Um, excuse me. Um, Where do you live, sir? Uh, 1724 Martin Laurel. Thank you, sir. Uh, my wife and I, Mar uh, Margaret and I, uh, moved here about three years and four months ago and bought our dream home there. And at the time we bought, we were told by the real estate agent that the property behind us uh, was owned by the Heights and was a state property. So we tore down the privacy fence and on one of the slides you saw our house with the flooding 
we put up that beautiful wrought iron fence because we thought that our property would remain with that type of view. Um, it's turning out that our dream property of this uh, R1 proposal is uh, approved will become more of a nightmare property to us. And at our age, you know, we don't have many more years to enjoy what we thought was going to be an outstanding and beautiful property. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Randy Perswell. Thank you. I'm Randy Perswell. I'm a realtor here in Kerrville, and I work for the developer. I have worked for him for the last five years, uh, selling the Heights properties. We sold out the Heights, uh, and we the plan was all along to not develop these lots that we're talking about until we sold out the Heights. Um, when I talked to the to Scott Kasarek here, who I've dealt with, I can say we've probably done 50 transactions over the years. Um, and he's had nothing but utmost uh, integrity in transactions and dealings. Uh, and, you know, we, we went in mind with this, with the, the neighborhood in mind, to be consistent with what is already there. Uh, we're trying to, we, you know, when we said we wanted to line up the lot lines with the lots existing there, uh, and try to be as consistent as what was already there. Um, you know, we try to be a good neighbor, and with that in mind, and and you know, uh, we're trying to also. I mean, 2050 plan. They want more lots, more housing. We felt like we were trying to add to that as well. But um, that's that's all I wanted to say. Is just that uh, I've dealt with Mr. Kasarik for years, and nothing but good dealings. Uh, he's an honest man, and he's done everything he says he'll do. Are the uh, Heights all estate lots? Yes. That's all the speakers I have. Uh, if there's anyone who wishes to speak before I close the public hearing. Yes, sir. Hello. Scott Kasarik. I am a manager of... Kerrville Heights LLC. I was going to give the introduction to Mike Welburn, but maybe I'll give a, a good conclusion instead. We all know who Mike is. <laughs> uh, you know, our intent is to have a development that conforms to the neighborhood. We purposely reduced the number of lots to increase the size. We wanted the fence lines to, to connect. We didn't want them to be staggered. We see that neighborhood as a part of the community. Um, the design of the streets helps mitigate the water. It's part of the solution. Um, we plan to be a good neighbor. We plan to follow through with the site development. I watched the YouTube video from the last um, meeting, and the question was, would we honor that concept plan? And the answer is yes, that we'd honor the concept plan. Um, we may have to tweak it per the city, uh, but our intent is to follow through and to make this a, a better community. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hi, Connor Odom, Well Warren Engineering and Surveying, 631 Water Street. I do want to clarify that our values that we showed you for post-development conditions does include 40% impervious cover. For the lot which is outlined in the city of Kerrville drainage design manual for single family residential housing. Mike, was there ever any thought of putting a drainage easement behind between the de development and the housing on that last blue section that you guys have? Sure. I mean, that is an option, but it's not necessary for because we are, we are reducing it. I will say this, the original plans for the Heights shows almost exactly the same layout that was, and it was planned for this. It was planned to allow the sheet flow through this, the subdivision of these two roads under existing conditions into the subject drainage easement that was brought up earlier that we showed the big waterfalls. It was designed to go through there and then over into 
the existing detention pond. Um, the, Mr. Cherick here, he has offered to put in a storm sewer pipe, eliminate what the original design was, divert it, and eliminate all that drainage, the 18 acres going through the existing subdivision over into the existing detention pond. That's a substantial amount of money that would be going into storm sewer pipe. Where would that be exactly? Get... So the pipe, yes. So if you look at the original, and Kyle can probably get you a copy of them for future reference, but the existing um, drainage area maps for the heights shows this pretty much the exact same layout that we have okay. right now. All right. And the pipe's there. No, there's no pipe. I know. But... They're going to let it go through the streets. Okay. We're, we're saying we're putting it in a pipe where the original plan didn't have original pipe, therefore eliminating that 18 acres from this area. So you saw the video of the water coming down there behind their houses. Correct. So you're going to have a row of homes above that with backyards and back up of those houses. Where is that water going to go? It'll go similar. Okay. Some of these houses that uh, develop, when they developed it, and Kyle can speak to this as well, you, you got to know what you're buying. And so they designed that to come over the wall. Um, in Ms. Peterson's case, they sound like they installed a trench drain to capture some of that water. We're the hill country. We can't eliminate right. um, drainage lot to lot to lot to lot. So what we do is we, we design intermediate storm sewer systems. In this case, the, the street and the storm sewer system will capture that water and reduce the amount of water going onto the adjacent property. We cannot create an adverse impact to a downstream property. Right. And so that's one of the things the city does in the review process. So theoretically, when you build this development and that those lots that back up to the backyards of Mountain Laurel, which is the video we saw where all the water was behind, just behind their house, which would be these homes' backyards, correct? Correct. You feel that's... Well, no, wait. Which video? The video where it was coming over the wall? No, no, the okay. video where Can it was... Can I clarify yeah. that video is the drainage ditch between Foothills and Mountain Laurel? Okay. So that's okay. where Mountain Laurel is right Further there? Down. Correct. Okay. That's behind that. Okay. And so we're actually reducing that water going to that location with this design. I want to close the public hearing at 552. Yeah. I guess we can have discussions or ask questions. Anybody have any questions, comments you want to make? Uh, the, uh, the heights is all uh, R. It's a R -E. state. R. -E. R, -E. R, -E. R -E. state. Yeah. So if you look at the, the one of those slides on on the back, there's that. Notice on this slide right here, there's a little rectangular shape in the lower right hand corner. Yes, sir. That's actually R one, because that's the only thing that was annexed or part of the city limits at the time. At the that whole piece is really set up for R1. The whole piece, the heights, everything. The, what, we're, what we're submitting for annexation, that is set up for R1. It's not set up for RE. The way the roads lay out, it wouldn't support right, yeah. one acre. Okay, lines. I got that. All right. And that what? little section there is already R1. Okay, R, R1. All right. Yes, sir. It's this, this portion right here is that's right. in the city already. In the city limits, correct. Anybody else? I think Mike's done a good job of demonstrating what the plan would look like and help alleviate. I know you're still very concerned about it, but I think, you know, as an engineer, they, they take into consideration the, you know, moving from just raw land to buildings, they have to take in that consideration for the watershed. Um, I think it's gonna improve your water issue. Um, 
I think it's unfortunate. I mean, we see this a lot in P and Z because we've got people that have been for years living with nothing in their backyard. And then all of a sudden the owners of the backyard decide that now is time. Now I'm going to develop this. And so as property owners, I mean, they have that right. And so it's unfortunate because you buy a house and you think, oh, this is, you know, nothing's ever going to happen back here, but then it does. And, um, it, it's, it's not fun for either one, my personal opinion. My perception of, of the, this is, is we're presenting with situations where property is zoned and it's entitled to be developed a certain way and we can't make a decision as much as we would, don't like it or don't agree with it. We can't make that decision that we're not going to allow that property owner to do it because it's zoned for that. I look at this different. I look at my responsibility here as being representatives of citizens of Kerrville and protecting the property that's in the city. So I don't lend as much credence to zoning property and, and, or, or annexing property and zoning it for someone that is presently outside the city. Uh, I feel my responsibility is to the, to the people that live in Kerrville, and that's my personal opinion. So the only thing we can do, I guess, now, if no, no one else has any responses or anything, is we can, you know, it, it, whatever happens here, we can, we can uh, approve this annexation and approve the zoning. Still going to go to city council for their approval. We can disapprove the annexation. Uh, it's still going to go to city council for their decision. So ultimately, the city council is going to make the decision whether they want this annex into the city or not. Well, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. She wants to make it up. Yes, ma'am. The issue of property rights keeps getting brought up. The idea that the owner of the property has the right to do what they want. Under, that, under normal circumstances, you know, Ms. Peterson, under normal circumstances, I would agree with you, but this is not, that, that property is not in the city, and they don't have a right to be in the city. That's my opinion. So what I, what I wanted to bring up is the idea that the property in question, um, and again, the neighborhood fully supports annexation. Uh, we've had people hunting back there, and there's zero enforcement available because it's county land. It is in the best interests of the neighborhood for that to become part of the city. We're not arguing that issue. The owner of that land has been receiving preferential taxation treatment for many years. It's currently designated D2 at the county level, which results in an extremely discounted tax rate for the owner with the idea that that exchanges, that, that helps the owner wait until development is appropriate and then that preferential taxation uh, makes it so that moving forward with development is intended to be in the best interests of the community. So that the issue of some have said in here before, it's their land, they should be able to do with it what they want. I would posit to the board that because they've been receiving preferential tax treatment, they really owe it to the community. There's a tacit understanding there that future development of that land is at the will of the community and to the maximum benefit of the community, not the owner. No, that, that question's above our pay grade. But what kind of, uh, is it ag exempt or what? No. Can I say something real quick? Yes, sir. Please. The, the issue of taxation is kind of irrelevant here, but let me address the concept of rollback taxes. When you change use for a, a, for a property, there is a concept that you look backwards in time and have to pay the taxes for the last five years. So we've, we've had low tax. We look forward to paying the tax when it comes due, and the tax on 40 lots will be much greater than it is now. Thank you. Yeah. You got anything to add? What are our options? Run our options again. Uh, so the, the request is going to City Council as as petitioned. So requested the annexation with the R1 zoning. City Council looks to the Planning Commission for a recommendation on the zoning request. 
positive or negative, um, and basically an opinion of should it be annexed or not. But the formal recommendation is for the zoning. So what we're look what what we're looking here is so we're not making a re are we making a recommendation on annexing the property? Is that one thing, and then the other thing is the zoning? The formal recommendation is just the zoning. So we're not even going to take issue with the annexation. So they're requesting a zoning of R1. Right. So our So if the decision, city council approves the annexation, then it's a what zoning okay, do we gotcha. think is appropriate? Okay. So we're not dealing with the annexation. So we're just making a recommendation on zoning. So they're requesting, so I would, I guess, request a motion to, if this property gets annexed, they're requesting R1 zoning. Is, is there a rec recommendation to approve it? What else would we zone it as? I mean, if R1 fits. You can zone it to, like she says, well, RV. you know, state. We're not dealing with that. We're not going to zone it. We're only going to, they've requested R1 zoning. We're either going to say yes or no. That's what we're going to do. Am I right, Drew? You can go to a more restrictive district. Um, so we can make a recommend recommendation that if this property gets annexed, it goes to RE zoning. Right. It'll still be presented to council. Council will have R1. R1. Okay. Commission's recommendation for RE. Well, I would... I don't guess I make a recommendation. Do I? <laughs> do I request a recommendation or do I make a recommendation as the chairman? You can make a motion. Let's send it as RE. So I would make a recommendation that if the property gets annexed, we recommend RE zoning. That's my that's my recommendation. That's my. I'll second that. So we have a uh, Let the city hash <laughs> proposal to if this property gets annexed into the city, it it comes with RE zoning. We have, so we have a, a recommendation and a second. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Passes. So our recommendation is that if this property gets annexed into the city, it will be uh, with RE zoning. Pass that along to city council. Anything else? Staff report? Just a quick update. Um, huge thank you to all of the people that were involved in the adoption of the new subdivision code. Uh, code review committee, um, some public engagement, of course, DNZ and city council. Uh, that'll be effective October 15th. And next for the board, we have a meeting on October 21st um, to present a handful of topics for updating the zoning code. Uh, some of those and the Planning Commission specifically requested uh, posting on the property for public hearings. Uh, so we're going to have a recommendation for that. Um, several other topics that staff have identified just over development projects that have come up and a couple of items specifically from City Council that we're going to be looking at. Um, amending some of the definitions for short-term rentals, just kind of cleaning that up one more time. Um, whether it's a requirement or just a recommended condition, also looking to require a local contact within a one hour's travel time. That's uh, a good idea. We've talked about that. We have not made that formal recommendation, but um, council did support that. That may be codified. It may just be a, a new condition that we add to that standard list. Let's see, what else am I missing? Some fencing cleanup. So most of it's just kind of clean up and massaging the right. zoning code as we've run into issues or um, unclear language in the code. What is our time frame for reviewing this thing with the sign on that property there, on the Hobby Lobby property? What I'm is? going to try to get it back to you guys in November. Um, I'll be mixing that with our regular meeting so that we don't have that second meeting week right before Thanksgiving. Um, it's going to depend on how much I can get drafted okay. on the zoning code update, but I'd like to bring it back to the next meeting if I can. So, appreciate it. Anything else? Anybody uh, got any? Yes, sir. But uh, signs, signs, signs. I, 
I'm going to try to bring it back to you November 4th. Okay. Do we have a meeting? October 21st. We do? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Anything else anybody wants on the agenda? All right. We're adjourned. Thank you, Thank guys. You guys.